colleagues, good afternoon. And it's good to see you all again back here for our uh, final lap. Um, we have the agenda for the 148th Assembly. We had already dealt with uh, item number one and two. Number three, we were supposed to conclude this afternoon, which we will do shortly for the reasons that I'm going to advance to you. So before we, uh, before we conclude item three, I would um, beg your indulgence that we go to item five first because the chair of the Standing Committee on Peace and International Security has a flight to catch this afternoon and she will be leaving in like 30 minutes from now. So I am requesting uh, you that you agree with me that we give her a chance to present so that she attends to the questions that you might have and then we will go back to conclude item number three and then we will take the order of the uh, items of the agenda as they are presented to you. So I don't see any reservations, so I take it that you approve what I have proposed. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me uh, now call uh, Ms. Augul Kuspan, who is the chair for our Standing Committee on Peace and International Security, and will be addressing, will be talking about addressing the social and humanitarian impact of autonomous weapon systems and artificial intelligence. Ms. Kuspan, you have the floor. Okay. Chers collègues, ma tâche initiale est de vous informer du résultat des délibérations de la Commission permanente sur la paix et la sécurité internationale qui a été chargée de débattre du point 5 de l'ordre du jour de la 148e Assemblée et de préparer le projet de résolution correspondant. La Commission permanente a d'abord tenu le 24 mars un débat animé sur le projet de résolution. Après les remarques introductives de l'un des co-rapporteurs de la Commission, 34 orateurs ont pris la parole au cours du débat qui a suivi. Celui-ci a permis aux membres de présenter de manière générale des amendements, mais aussi de soit soutenir, soit exprimer dès ce moment, des désaccords sur le concept et les terminologies qui devraient être utilisées dans la résolution. Nous avons ensuite procédé à l'examen de 200 amendements reçus par le secrétariat dans les délais impartis. Je dois souligner ici que les discussions au cours du débat et des négociations, bien que parfois vives, sont restées cohérentes et ont permis l'expression d'une multitude de points de vue. Le résultat de ces négociations est une résolution qui souligne le rôle des parlements dans la sensibilisation, l'élaboration de législation nationale et la responsabilisation des gouvernements. La résolution souligne aussi les sérieuses questions d'ordre éthique, juridique et sécuritaire soulevé par les systèmes d'armes autonomes et rappelle que le développement et l'utilisation des armes autonomes devraient être conformes au droit international, notamment au droit de l'homme et au droit international humanitaire. Elle appelle finalement de ses voeux une réglementation internationale pour éviter une course aux armements et garantir un contrôle humain sur ces armes. Hier, la Commission a adopté la résolution par un vote. L'Inde, la République islamique d'Iran et la Russie ont indiqué s'opposer à l'ensemble du texte de la résolution. La Lituanie et la Chine ont émis une réserve sur l'ensemble du texte de la résolution. L'Australie, le Canada, le Cuba, la France, la Nouvelle-Zélande, la République de Corée, le Royaume-Uni et la Turquie ont émis des réserves sur plusieurs paragraphes, ainsi que, 
pour certains sur l'utilisation du terme « système d'armes autonomes » sans la caractéristique de létalité. Le texte de la résolution vous est maintenant soumis pour l'adoption de l'Assemblée de l'UIP. Avant de conclure, je voudrais vous informer que le bureau de la Commission a, pour la première fois, fait usage de sa capacité de déterminer un thème d'étude après avoir longuement débattu de la situation à Gaza. Le bureau a décidé de proposer que le prochain thème de la Commission de la paix et de la sécurité internationale porte sur le rôle des parlements dans la promotion d'une solution à deux États en Palestine. Il a aussi proposé que pour des raisons d'inclusivité, du fait de la sensibilité du sujet, chaque groupe géopolitique ait la possibilité de proposer un co-rapporteur s'il le souhaite. Pour le moment, deux noms ont été reçus par le secrétariat, mais je ne doute pas que d'autres suivront. Je souhaite aux co-rapporteurs bonne chance et une coopération fructueuse pour une résolution réussie et les assure du soutien de l'ensemble de la Commission. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you so much. Um... Madam President, for the Standing Committee on Peace and International Security. Uh, members, according to Article 32, some Article 2, if any delegations wish to explain their, vote, uh, their votes briefly, they will do so after um, we have already made a decision. And the same applies should a delegation wish to express a reservation without opposing the adoption of the uh, resolution. So, um, um, can you raise the name of the country, please? Iran. Okay, I have been guided here. I first have to, um, before I give the floor to uh, the Republic of Iran, I have to ask the assembly, after listening to the, after listening to the presentation that was made by the chair here, do we adopt the resolution? Thank you very much. The resolution is adopted. Now I'll give a chance to Iran because they had wanted to say something. Where is Iran? No, he doesn't need to take the floor. Oh, sorry. He doesn't need to take the floor. So, and I don't see any other requests. India. India, okay. India, you have the floor. Stay India, you have the floor. Uh, respected President, as kindly aware, the Indian delegation has apprised the chair of the first standing committee on peace and international security in the plenary of the committee that India does not associate with the resolution entitled, I quote, addressing the social and humanitarian impact of autonomous weapon system and artificial intelligence, unquote. Now I request you that our dissociation with the resolution may please be reflected in the final version of the resolution adopted by the assembly in a form of a footnote. Thank you, Chair, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. India, that is taken care of uh, on, the, on, on page five of the resolution. We have a footnote that indicates India and the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Russian Federation expressed their opposition to the entire text of the resolution. So it's taken care of India. I don't see any other hand, and since we had already uh, adopted the resolution, I, 
I would now see the, uh, I would now understand that there are no questions. There are no questions and so we are done. Thank you for accepting this resolution with of course some reservations that have been shown but also the noted objections that have been made. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for that and we wish you safe travels. Um, Um, thank you so much. So like I said, uh, colleagues, we will go back to item three of our agenda, which is talking about the general debate on the theme, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. I am pleased to note that over the past four days of our assembly, we have had very robust deliberations on a series of highly relevant issues. I would propose that we now proceed with consideration of item number three, which is talking about the general debate on parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. We have had substantive and robust deliberations over the past three days, having heard some 185 interventions from close to 130 national parliaments and 20 partner organizations. Speakers of parliament, deputy speakers, members of parliament, including many young members of parliament, experts and officials have all shared their experiences, good practices and wisdom. In our deliberations, we recognized the importance of parliamentary diplomacy as a means to build trust, cooperation, and peace, and to advance democratic principles and human rights standards worldwide. We spoke about the need for immediate action from all of us, understanding that the intractable and complex challenges facing our world require collective and durable responses. Now, as parliamentarians, we are uniquely placed to ensure compliance with the rule of law and international norms, which are essential for the alleviation of conflicts which are causing widespread suffering. From Gaza to Ukraine, from Sudan to Afghanistan, from Yemen to Myanmar, to name just a few. We have also highlighted other areas where parliamentary diplomacy can make a contribution to peace. Now in this area, because we are going to give you a summary of our, um, our declaration, which will be Geneva Declaration, I had requested that we share this uh, summary instead of the president doing it, I'll share with the, the, the youngest in the house, youngest me male member of parliament and also uh, youngest female member of parliament. And so I would request that they come before and address us. Are they here already? Thailand. Yeah, Thailand, I was informed there is a, we will have a male member of parliament from Thailand. Please come forward. And then we will have the lady from So, yeah, and Namibia, please, if you can all come forward. So, because this is part of empowering our youth, and you all know that we always talk about inclusivity, and we would like to be giving them some of these roles so that they are ready to take up when some of us retire. So, from Thailand, please come up. So they are going to highlight some of the areas where we have highlighted in the course of our deliberations how parliamentary diplomacy is going to work. I don't know whether we already have one. And uh, are we making progress or I should start? 
the problem? I wasn't aware that this is happening, so I just gave you Please allow him to read now. Can he take the podium? Half of it. So shall I tell him I've redone it so it's okay, bigger for me to see? Where do you want him to? So do we start it from this? No, no, I gave you the papers. Oh, this one. Just read until addressing. Please begin from here okay. up to here. Okay. okay sure. Please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President, um, General Secretary, um, esteemed. Uh, colleagues, I'm the youngest and the baby of Thai Parliament. <laughs> now I'm just 27 years old. I'm I'm have an honor to to speak to you all today, and thank you for the best session for uh, many days that we have done before. Okay, I will start with um, the text from um, our colleagues that to, to um, highlight for you guys. We have also highlighted other areas where parliamentary diplomacy can make a contribution to peace, including harness, uh, harnessing the potential of parliamentarians to act as mediators and dialogue facilitators and bolstering citizens engaging in these processes. Enacting, overseeing, and monitoring the implementation of peace agreements and guaranteeing funding for healthcare, transitional justice, and institutional reforms. Urging all states to adhere, adhere strictly to the 1949 Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols, and advocating for increased recourse to the International Court of Justice and other international judicial institutions. Understanding the particular vulnerable or vulnerability of young people to conflicts and radicalization. Recognizing the vital role that women can and should play in conflict prevention and peace building. Taking measures to prevent violence against women girls, and marginalized group. Taking, um, condemning identity-based hatred and advocating for holistic dialogue process to promote understanding. Recognizing that the deterioration of peace and escalation in conflicts disproportionately affects vulnerable and marginalized members of society and jeopardized um, development gains and the achievement of the sustainable, sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam President and esteemed colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Honorable Tong Jai Sod from Thailand. Um, informed is 27 years old. Thank you so much. Now, uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, um, Madam President. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Emma Tangi Muteka, and I hail from the land of the brave Namibia. I will continue where my colleague has ended. <laughs> Addressing the underlying causes of conflict and the needs of at-risk members of population by increasing our focus on human security, applying a common security approach to finding solutions for establishing a shared sense of security, monitoring the early warnings of conflict 
and preventing escalation through disarmament, reducing military spending, shifting budget priority, and holding governments to account. Working towards demilitarization of cyberspace and artificial intelligence, instead harnessing their potential for scientific breakthroughs, international cooperation and peace, restoring trust in multilateralism. I thank you. Thank you so much, Emma Mateka, and um, you can come here for a picture, both of you, and then you can get going. I, I hope this will inspire you to go do some more work so that you stay in politics. Okay. You come close. Yeah. I hope they are able to take the pictures. Okay. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you for helping me. Thank you so very much. Okay. Um, Dear colleagues, the draft Geneva Declaration on Parliamentary Diplomacy is now before you, and I'm not seeing any uh, hands, so I take it that we all uh, adopted the Geneva Declaration. Thank you very much. It is so decided. Uh, colleagues. Although we were not able to adopt an emergency item resolution on the need for urgent action to address the situation in Gaza, this humanitarian catastrophe has been at the forefront of our deliberations and consultations. We cannot remain silent. We do not have the time to reopen the discussion here as we have other items of the agenda and we must complete all of them. But the Secretary General and I have prepared a leadership statement on the need for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, which is based on the fundamental points that I believe we all agree with. The two of us plan to issue this leadership statement today. And this statement will read as follows. In view of the worsening situation in Gaza, we call for urgent action to alleviate the suffering of the people in the region, including women, children, and the elderly who have been caught up in the fighting. On behalf of the global parliamentary community, we call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. We reiterate our demand for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. We appeal for the relevant authorities on all sides to expand the flow of essential humanitarian aid to reach those in need in Gaza. We reiterate our utter condemnation of any violence against civilians and stress the need for respect for international humanitarian law. That is how our statement will read. So, thank you. I see the delegation of Nigeria. Okay, I've just read um, what the statement will read like, but I'm seeing Nigeria has, would like to take the floor. Nigeria, you have the floor. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Asukwe Peon, Senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Madam President, I have listened attentively to the statement you, you are prepared to issue yourself and the Secretary General. And um, Madam President and this assembly, the leader of the Nigerian delegation, His Excellency, the Senate President of Nigeria, Senator Godwill Akpabio, on Sunday, the 24th of March, made a passionate appeal on the floor of this assembly. He pleaded that we take off the toga of politics and adorn the toga of humanity, adorn the toga of parents. He stated here on, this, uh, on the floor of this assembly that most of us here agree with certain principles. He stated here 
that most of us are in agreement for a ceasefire. He stated that we are all in agreement that there should be a release of hostages and access to humanitarian aid. What the president has just read out is mostly what all of us here are in agreement. This present conflict began this present conflict began on the 7th of October, 2023, and we met in Luanda, Angola on the 23rd of March, on the 23rd of October, but we failed to reach a resolution. We are meeting here today again in March of 2024. Today is the 27th of March, 2024. Thousands of people have died. It has been, by the 7th of April, which is barely a week from today, this conflict would have been six months on. This assembly has met twice, and today is the last day of this assembly. If we leave here today, at the closure of this 148 assembly, without us making a statement, we would have met twice during the course of this conflict without the assembly making a, a statement. I pray and I plead that Thank we you. put it to the assembly that we can adopt this statement as an assembly. Please, I plead with the members of this assembly to look into this. That is my prayer. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Thank you for the leadership statement, um, which I fail to reconcile in terms of its status. I would have preferred that the leadership statement be a statement of this assembly rather than the statement of the leadership because we are meeting here as an institution of IPU, and the IPU must, as an assembly, make such a statement to that effect, and not a leadership statement. That's the first observation. The second observation is, uh, a follow-up to what Nigeria said. Madam President, this is the second time that we have failed to come up with an emergency item. And yet, the tenets of our founding fathers, Krima and Passe, have ex extolled the need for diplomacy, dialogue, and negotiation. Now, we leave this assembly today with this Geneva Convention where it is saying we should exercise parliamentary diplomacy, dialogue, and negotiation in order to look at the conflicts that are, in fact, threatening global peace in the world. Now, if we as an institution cannot apply diplomacy, negotiation, and dialogue within the institution, what moral ground do we have to leave this place and say we are going to advocate for diplomacy, negotiation, when we have failed to agree on an emergency item for the second time as an assembly, Thank I think you. this is a contradiction of the highest order. Thank is, you. A, is an element of the highest irony that we are failing to apply that which we believe are the tools of ending conflict within our own organization. Thank Madam you. President, I hope it will not happen again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
I believe, dear colleagues, we understand the interventions uh, that have been given. Um, they weren't really uh, directed to the leadership of IPU because you're the people who voted against whatever that was on the table. So, uh, so that said, this is called, uh, this initially, before I give you more explanation, is called the leadership statement because we have, you have given us the mandate, me and the Secretary General, to issue statements when something happens in the world. So we have, we have been doing this on your behalf. And even this one, after the assembly failed to, uh, to attain the required number of votes, then we, th we thought it was impetus for us to do something. So this is what we have done, but irrespectively, much as I, uh, I think the two colleagues have spoken, and we can now agree, if you so wish, that this leadership statement, instead of being a usual leadership statement, which we usually do, me and the Secretary General, now it can also read as you are part of it, if you so wish. If you would wish to endorse it, Okay, would I be right if I say this statement, the leadership statement has been endorsed by the assembly? Yes. Okay. Okay, the, the ISS is endorsed, but I think the, the clubs have been more? Okay, because um, this matter, the way it was brought to us, it is difficult for me to say it is uh, unanimously agreed when I hear the no's in the house. That being the case, it will only uh, draw back to me again to say it will remain as a leadership statement. Agreed? Well, the no's and the yeses, but uh, because it wasn't part of the agenda and it's not really discussed in a way that we do according to our rules, it wouldn't be fair for me to say it has been adopted by the assembly when, when some of you are saying no. If it was by consensus, we would take it that way, but the statement I've read to you, it will eventually, be, be, it will eventually go out there as a leadership statement, yeah? We agree? Thank you. So that's done. And uh, so we will now move. We had already looked at um, item five. So we go to item. Okay, thank you. So we go to item six, which is dealing with uh, partnerships for climate change, promoting access to affordable green energy, and ensuring innovation, responsibility, and equity. So um, you have before you the revised draft resolution as prepared by the standing committee and is circulated uh, to you. May I now request the president of our standing committee, uh, Mr. Waven William of Seychelles, to introduce to us the draft resolution. Madam. President, okay. Where do I press? Okay. Try it. Okay, thank you. Madam President, Secretary General, distinguished uh, uh, colleagues, parliamentarians of IPU, my task is, is to inform you of the outcome of deliberations of the Standing Committee on Sustainable Development. The committee was entrusted with the task of debating and preparing a draft resolution 
on partnerships for climate action, promoting access to affordable green energy and ensuring innovation, responsibility, and equity. The co rapporteurs were Ms. Mira Al Suwedi from United Arab Emirates, who, who's, who is also the vice chair of this committee, Ms. Lesia Vasilenko from Ukraine, and Mr. Sami Patra from India. They prepared a draft resolution and accompanying explanatory note. I take this opportunity to, re to reiterate my thanks to the co rapporteur for their great work, dedication, and commitment. I have also to mention the names of the IPU Secretariat staff members, Alexandria, Carly, Isabel, and Miriam, who coordinated the work of the committee in a collective effort for efficiency and precise guidance. I was flanked by a crew of super and amazing women professionals to do the job, and the whole committee delivered. They deserve a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Drafting of the resolution was conducted in plenary. The committee had received 293 amendments submitted by 27 member parliaments. This was a record number of amendments for our committee. Thanks to the engagement of the co-rapporteurs and all committee members, we were able to conclude the drafting process within the time allocated to us. I hereby thank all of them for their contributions, ingenuity, and team spirit. The team collaboration and the committee members' focus and objective engagement paid off. Yesterday afternoon, the committee examined the consolidated draft resolution and adopted the text by acclamation. India and Iran expressed reservations on the whole text. China expressed reservations on preambular paragraphs 7 and 8, and operative paragraphs 7, 8, and 25. Turkey expressed reservations on operative paragraphs 24, 25, and 26. The resolutions to seek advanced parliamentary action on meeting international commitments to address climate change by accelerating the transition to zero and low emissions technologies in a just and equitable manner, ensuring alignment with the Paris Agreement and results of the first global stock take. The committee also approved a work plan for the next assembly. It includes a debate on the theme of the next resolution, a panel debate, the theme, the role of parliaments in preventive corporate tax avoidance and achieving sustainable development as well as a segment to prepare for the parliamentary meeting at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Azerbaijan, COP29. The committee reiterates its commitment to honoring its obligation, notes the steps being taken by the IPU leadership to consider amendments requests to improve, to improve the rules and statutes, to, to ensure that the dynamism of IPU stay on course with its mission. God bless you all and a safe journey back home with renewed vigor and determination. Madam President, I thank you. I submit. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. We really appreciate. You have, excuse me, Mr. President of the committee, please have a seat here and we, as we adopt this first and then ask the members if they have any questions. Uh, colleagues, do I take it that the Assembly adopts this resolution? Thank you very much. It has been approved. And now I would, um, I was looking around just to see if anybody would like to take the floor, and I don't see any, so I take it uh, we have approved uh, this, we have adopted this resolution and there are no questions. The reservations that were raised are well noted. I believe we have all seen that. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Oh, he has left already. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. President. That was fast. Okay. So now uh, we move to our, we move to item seven, which is reports of the 
uh, standing committees. Now, um, our first one. Okay. The first one will be our standing committee on democracy and human rights. Please, you have the floor. Okay, Mr. Torosian of Armenia, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable President, Secretary General, distinguished delegates. <clears throat> the standing committee held two debates during this assembly. On Monday, there was a preparatory debate on the resolution entitled The Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Democracy, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law. The debate was introduced by the reporters of the resolution, Michelle Rempel Garner of Canada and Nima Lugangira of Tanzania. It also benefited from opening remarks from the International Telecommunication Union and UNESCO, the two lead organizations on the AI within the UN system. The main message from the debate was very clear. Delegates see the many potential benefits that artificial intelligence can bring, such as creating new economic opportunities, accelerating medical research, and identifying actions to mitigate climate change. But more than 30 delegates who took the floor also expressed many concerns on issues that go to the fundamental aspects of our societies, including elections and democratic processes. Delegates asked, what will the development of AI mean for our ability to trust each other and to have confidence in what we see and hear? How do we limit the risks of negative uses of AI? What can parliaments do to safeguard people's rights and ensure that technology helps us to build the society we want? These are the pressing questions that the rapporteurs will seek to address as they draft the resolution which will be discussed at the next assembly in October. The standing committee also held an important debate on sustainable actions to improve the life conditions of people with disabilities, including their chances for education and work opportunities. We had a dialogue with the chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, complemented by the perspectives of parliamentarians who are at the forefront of the work to ensure the rights of people with disabilities. The debate highlighted the important role parliaments can play to advance implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities by ensuring laws, policies, and budgets advance their full inclusion in the community and remove all forms of discriminations and stigma based on disability. This includes addressing the multiple and intersectional forms of discrimination based on age, sex, gender, social origin, and others. Delegates put forward suggestions for IPU can pursue work in this area and recommend it. First, to develop a handbook for parliamentarians on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, similar to the IPU handbooks on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Two, to continue to foster such exchanges among parliamentarians on the topic. And three, to explore the possibility of setting up a dedicated working group on persons with disabilities. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tarosian. Members, I take it that we note the report of our standing committee. Do we note that? Thank you very much. We now move to uh, the Standing Committee on United Nations Affairs. And my, may I take this opportunity to welcome the President of the Standing Committee of, um, the United, on United Nations Affairs, Mr. David McGuinty of Canada to present his report. Mr. McGuinty, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is David McGinty. I am the President of the Standing Committee on United Nations Affairs, having been elected to the position last October. I have the honour to present our committee's work here at the 148th Assembly. Let me say at the outset how pleased and proud I was to open every session of our committee and its bureau, pointing to the IPU's new harassment policy. And colleagues, if you haven't seen or read the policy yet, I would commend it to you. This is an extraordinary important tool 
to ensure a safe workplace for all IPU staff and delegates. And it brings the IPU uh, into or uh, to a level of anti-harassment policy, which is very much a gold standard here and around the world. Our committee held two sessions here in Geneva. In our first session, we were very pleased to welcome the newly chosen United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs, Dr. Felipe Paulier, who is just three months into his job. Dr. Paulier elaborated on the new Office of Youth Affairs mandate to facilitate youth access to debates and processes across the UN system. He talked about trust. He talked about regaining trust. He talked about hope. He provided good examples of engagement taking place in various parts of the world and encouraged parliamentarians present to engage actively with the young people in their respective countries. Parliamentarians were very keen to embrace Dr. Paulier's message that highlighted the world's changed, changed demographics. More specifically, that the fact that now we have on this planet the largest single number of young people ever. Some 48 delegations were present for the vigorous discussion. Over 18 interventions were made, some of which highlighted innovative ideas from their own experiences engaging youth in their national work. The second session yesterday afternoon focused on the sustainability of the United Nations humanitarian work. The committee members were briefed by high-level officials from the UN Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance, the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, the World Food Program, and the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the, in the Near East, otherwise known as UNRWA. These officials shared important information regarding the state of the world and noted that beyond the headline-grabbing crises in Ukraine and Gaza, there are fires burning in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Sudan, and elsewhere. They were unanimous in stating this, that at the same time global military expenditures have reached a rec record-breaking 2.3 trillion dollars per year, the UN's humanitarian system, despite inadequate funding, is delivering. Be aware, colleagues, the United Nations now has a hiring freeze. It is shutting down parts of buildings here in Geneva and New York. It is turning off elevators and lights and air conditioning systems in order to pay the bills. But these individuals reminded us that one in five children is now living in conflict. One in 73 people is forcibly displaced. 309 million people are experiencing acute food insecurity. 45 million children globally are at risk of wasting. UNRWA has had 171 of its workers in Gaza killed in the conflict. Over 34 delegations were present for this important discussion and 16 made profound interventions. All of them praised the UN's work. Some noted their nation's specific contributions of humanitarian assistance. And it's fair to say, all heard the urgent plea for more support in our national budgets for the work these agencies are doing to ensure people can reach their potential everywhere, that we live, leave no one behind and live sustainably. Several parliamentarians asked for more focus in humanitarian efforts to prevent or address conflicts, particularly those that are forgotten or festering conflicts. The committee approved a motion put forward by its bureau. The motion encourages parliamentarians to engage domestically on Security Council reform, foster debate in their parliament, discuss this issue with their permanent representative to the United Nations, be ready to ratify any changes to the Security Council that might be forthcoming. This was just the second motion the committee has ever passed as part of its new effort to focus on its work plan. Furthermore, on Monday, I was pleased to chair a high-level meeting of speakers and deputy speakers in preparation for the sixth World Conference of Speakers. The discussion focused on the profound crisis of multilateralism and featured the UN Director for Geneva, as well as Rebecca Greenspan, 
the Secretary General for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And finally, colleagues, the committee filled two vacancies in its bureau with Mr. Hekab Arshakian of Armenia and Mr. Marcello Asalinas Gonzalez of Paraguay being elected for two-year terms for the Eurasian and Grulak groups. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Can I take it that the Assembly takes note of this report? It is so decided. We can now proceed to item number eight of our agenda, approval of the subject items for the resolutions to be adopted by the Standing Committee's Peace and International Security and respectively on Sustainable Development at the 150th IPU Assembly and appointment of the Rapporteurs. May I draw your attention to document A, 1488R1REV. As you will see, the Standing Committee on Peace and International Security is proposing as a subject item for the next one year cycle the theme of the role of parliaments in advancing a two state solution in Palestine. Mr. Bouchet of Algeria, Mr. Boutemea of Ireland have been designated as rapporteurs on this subject item. Is the Assembly ready to adopt this decision? It is so decided. Moreover, as you will see, the Standing Committee on Sustainable Development is proposing as its subject item for the next one-year cycle the theme of parliamentary strategies to mitigate the long-lasting impact of conflicts, including armed conflicts on sustainable development. Mr. Fogiel from Poland, Ms. Faiz from Bahrain and Ms. Emma Muteka from Namibia have been designated as the rapporteurs on this subject item. Is the Assembly ready to adopt this decision? It is so decided. Let us now proceed to item five. We welcome our president back to the seat. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, we will now start hearing from the, our chairs of different geopolitical groups. So we will begin with um, Speaker Cho Chaduri from Bangladesh, who will be uh, presenting on behalf of the Asia Pacific Group. the chair of Asia Pacific Group. And then we'll be followed by speaker from Algeria, speaker Bugali, who will be representing the Arab group, and then Africa group will follow. Speaker Chaduri, you have the floor, thank you. Madam President of IPU, Secretary General, distinguished delegates, a very good afternoon to you all. It's a very special privilege for me to chair the meeting of Asia Pacific Group, which was held on the 23rd of March, 2024, at the 148th IPU Assembly in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm also delighted to share with you that I have undertaken the responsibility to lead Asia Pacific Group as a chair for the next one year. 32 member states of Asia Pacific Group were present in the meeting and took part in resolving all agendas on the basis of mutual consensus. The meeting started with opening remarks by myself as a chair of the group 
Agenda of the meeting was adopted at the beginning with inclusion of an additional agenda of filling in vacancy of Vice President position of Executive Committee of IPU as proposed by Australia. Australia was given the floor to place the additional agenda and the name of the Member of Parliament from India, Ms. Sarangi, was presented to me and adopted with adoption of the additional agenda. Mr. K. Sub Sung, Member of House of Representatives of Thailand, filled the vacancy in the committee to promote respect for international humanitarian law. One emergency item was placed by Indonesia and Malaysia in relation to the situation in Gaza, and on the basis of majority vote of the members of the group, the proposal was forwarded to the Governing Council of IPU. Some reports were presented, and amongst them was ASEAN plus three group report. While China and Australian male speakers were included in the preparatory committee of the upcoming World Speakers Conference 2025, no women speakers' name could be found. Two women members of parliament, one from Iran and one from Pakistan, was forwarded for consideration by the IPU. Let me conclude by expressing my heartfelt thanks to Madam President of the IPU, Honorable Dr. Tulia Aksin, Speaker of Tanzania, for attending the Asia-Pacific Group meeting amidst her very busy schedule and speaking to all members. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker, for those uh, very informative words. I had already mentioned Speaker Abugali from Algeria, who will be representing the Arab group. Mr. Speaker, you have the floor. I uh, will be followed by Africa and then um, Grulak. Grulak will come up. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. معالي الرئيسة المحترمة سعادة سيد الأمين العام المحترم أخوات والأخوة والإخوة وأساء البرلمانات وأساء الوفود والسادة الحضور أحييكم جميعا وأتمنى لكم عودة ميمونة إلى أوطانكم وباسم المجموعة الجيوسية سيد العربية أتمنى لاتحادنا هذا كل التوفيق والنجاح وأشكر القائمين على التنظيم والإعداد الجيد لأعمال هذه الجمعية وفي ذات الوقت ينتابني الأسف والألم الشديدين لعدم استطاعتنا لا بل لإخفاقنا في إقرار بند طارئ على جدول أعمال هذه الجمعية للمرة الثانية على التوالي وهذا يجعلنا نشعر ومن نمثل من الشعوب في كافة إنحاء المعمورة أن الأهداف التي أسس هذا الاتحاد لتحقيقها والقائمة على تحقيق الأمن والسلم الدوليين لم تعد الأولوية الأولى لممثلي شعوب, شعوب العالم ففلسطين المحتلة من قبل الكيان الصهيوني الغاصب وعلى وجه الخصوص قطاع غزة يشهد حرب همجية تمارس فيها كافة أشكال الإبادة الجماعية وبدعم من دول تدعي أنها تسعى لتحقيق السلم والأمن الدوليين وللأسف الشديد شهدت مناطق مختلفة من العالم وعلى سبيل المثال الحصر أفغانستان والشقيق العراق ضمارا ونهبا للمقدرات علما بأن ما كان يدعى به من ذرائع كان عكس ذلك تماما أيها الإخوة والأخوات الأفاضل إننا نشهد على مدار ستة أشهر الماضية ما يجري للشعب الفلسطيني الشقيق من قتل وتنكيل وتدمير للبنى التحتية لا يستثني من ذلك لا المدارس ولا ضوء العبادة ولا المستشفيات ولا مقرات المنظمات الدولية ناهيكم عن أكثر من 33 ألف شهيد أزهقت أرواحهم أغلبهم من أطفال والنساء والشيوخ وهذا بحد ذاته يجعلنا نشعر جميعا بالخوف والرعب من المستقبل وعلى الأجيال القادمة الإخوة والأخوات لقد آن الأوان لتذكير بإعادة النظر في النظام العالمي المتبع حاليا وما يتم تطبيقه في هيئة الأمم المتحدة من ممارسات أفقدتها قيمتها الحقيقية التي تستحق وأطاحت بالأهداف السامية التي أنشئت من أجلها وختاما أتمنى لكم جميعا دولا وشعوبا 
أن تكونوا دعاة للسلم والسلام والأمن والأمان في كل بقاع العالم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته شكراً Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and also President of the Arab uh, Group. I had already mentioned um, Mr. Bowden, who is representing the Africa Geopolitical Group. Okay, I, I, would, I would request that all the presidents please come and sit here so that it's easier to take the floor. So. Uh, the, the president of the Africa Geopolitical Group, Mr. Bowden uh, from Algeria, will take the floor now and will be followed by Grulak, 12 plus, will also come up. سيدة رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي سيدة توليا أكسنت سيد الأمين العام للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي مسيو مارتن تونغونغ سادة رؤساء الحاضرين معنا سادة الوفود أعضاء الوفود رؤساء الوفود الحاضرين معنا باسم المجموعة الجيوسياسية الإفريقية نتمنى أن تكون يعني أشغال جمعيتنا 148 الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي قد كللت بالنجاح واسمحوا لي أن أشكر كل من ساهم في إنجاح هذه الجمعية العامة من السيدة الرئيسة من السيد الأمين العام هو والطاقم طاقم من السادة المستشارين وكل طاقم الأمانة العامة لاتحاد البرلماني الدولي الذين صهروا على تحضير هذه الجمعية العامة وإذ كما نود أن نقول أن صحيح أننا ربما اختلفنا ولم نستطع أن نتبنى بندا طارئا لهذه الجمعية العامة 148 لكن أيضا اختلاف كان في كلمة واحدة جنوب إفريقيا والذي باسمكم جميعا نود أن نوجه لها كل التحيات على كل ما تقوم به من أجل تسليط الضوء تسليط الضوء على القضايا التي يحدث فيها ظلم في العالم من أجل نصرة القضايا العادلة في العالم نقول أن المجموعة الإفريقية والمجموعة العربية تبنت البند الطارئ لجنوب إفريقيا مجموعة 12 بلاس تبنت البند الطارئ لفرنسا والدنمارك للأسف كلا البندين طارئين يصبان في تجاه القضية الفلسطينية لكن للأسف الاختلاف كان في كلمة واحدة لا يعني الفشل في تبني بن طارق يعني أن الجمعية العامة قد فشلت لكن بالعكس أنا أعتبر أنه أيضا الجمعية العامة قد نجحت وقد سلطت الضوء على مكامن الاختلاف بيننا في أزمة واحدة اختلفنا على كلمة واحدة نرجو أن نركز سيد الأمين العام والسيد الرئيس على هذه الكلمة من أجل إنجاح كل القرارات التي ستصدر على الجمعيات العامة القادمة الآن القضية الفلسطينية وهي تحاكي أحلك الأزمات التي مرت بها الشعوب في كل العالم عبر كل التاريخ شعب يظلم شعب يباد الجمعية العامة 148 لأعرق منظمة سياسية متعددة الأطراف تحتاج دعمكم تحتاج إعلاء صوتكم كيف لا ومجلس الأمن قد تبنى قرارا من أجل وقف الحرب في غزة وإطلاق صراحة الرهائن لكنه أيضا تكلم قرار مجلس الأمن تكلم أيضا عن المعتقلين وضرورة إطلاق صراحة المعتقلين وفق القرارات والقوانين ذات الصلة كيف للأمم المتحدة ومجلس الأمن يتبنى مثل هذه الكلمات والجمعية عامة لـ 140 للبرلمانيين الذين هم أكثر حرية من الحكومات نفشل 
في التوافق على هذه الكلمه نحن باسم المجموعه الافريقيه لا نعتبر ذلك فشلا كما قلنا لكن نعتبر ذلك ارضيه اخرى توضع لنا من اجل معرفه الخلافات والتسليط عليها وتجاوزها في المستقبل سيد الامين العام سيد الرئيس المجموعه الافريقيه وهي مشكله من 45 برلمانا وطنيا تتطلع للعمل معكم من اجل تقيه العمل البرلماني في افريقيا من اجل التعاون التقني مع الامانه العامه للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي من اجل التطلع لرقمنه البرلمانات الوطنيه وتوفير يعني دورات تكوينيه لكل الموظفين والفاعلين الاداريين وحتى النواب من اجل ممكن الاحتكاك مع الأمانة العامة والاحتكاك من خلالها مع باقي برلمانات العالم وباسم المجموعة الإفريقية اسمحوا لي مرة أخرى أن نزكي وأن ندعم القرار الذي أصدره مجلس الأمن رقم 2728 والداعي لإطلاق الفوري للنار في غزة خلال شهر رمضان ونتمنى إن شاء الله أن يصدر كل سيكون كل الاعمال التي تقوم بها الامانه العامه ورئاسه الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي في هذا الاتجاه لانه الان لا ازمه تعلو على ازمه غزه، لا ازمه انسانيه علت على ازمه على ازمه غزه عبر التاريخ القريب ونحن الان كما اؤكد لكم اننا برلمانيين يفترض فينا اننا نمتلك اكبر هامش من الحريه أنا اننا نعمل من اجل وقف هذه الحروب من أجل أن يسود السلام في العالم ونقول أن البرلمان الذي أترأس باسمه المجموعة الإفريقية برلمان الجزائر الجزائر هي التي كانت دائما سباقة للدعوة للتعايش السلمي وهي التي كانت صاحبة فكرة إعلان الأمم المتحدة يوما للتعايش السلمي في العالم شكرا السيد الأمين العام شكرا السيدة الرئيسة ونلتقي في جمعيات أخرى جمعيات عامة أخرى نتوق أن تكون أكثر فاعلية لمنظمة أعتبرها شخصيا أهم منظمة سياسية متعددة الأطراف بعد الأمم المتحدة لا يجب أن ننتقص من قيمة منظمة برلمانيات العالم منظمة برلمانات العالم بالعكس نحن من سيكون لنا الكلمة العليا من أجل إعلاء كلمة الحق للقضايا العادلة في العالم شكرا Thank you very much uh, I would now go to Grulag uh, I will now call the president of the Grulag Sofia Kajala Kavajal from Mexico please you have the floor Thank you very much Mrs. President I will begin ah, en español. Voy a hablar en español. I'm going to speak in, in Spanish. Eh, querida Presidenta Tulia Axon, muchísimas gracias por tu apoyo, por tu cercanía con el Grupo Latinoamericano, por tu calidez, eh, por tu cariño. Secretario General Martin Chungong, muchas gracias también por tu cercanía con el Grupo Latinoamericano y por todo tu apoyo. Te lo agradecemos muchísimo. Eh, también le quiero extender un agradecimiento a la embajadora Anda Phillips porque me ha dado una asistencia personal que le agradezco muchísimo. Gracias, embajadora, por tu cercanía también. Y bueno, eh, <ríe> quiero continuar eh, dándole un… Eh, Mencionando a Sally Ann Sider por todo su apoyo en 30 años de servicio, el que ha brindado a, a los miembros del GRULAC y especialmente a la Secretaría Técnica, y le quiero desear de parte de todo el grupo latinoamericano que esta nueva etapa sea de mucho éxito y de, mucho, eh, y de, y de mucha valía para ella. Así que, Sally Ann, gracias por tus años de servicio y mis mejores deseos, nuestros mejores deseos de parte de todos. Eh, quiero decirle a la UIP que me siento muy contenta de que tengamos tantos países latinoamericanos participando activamente en ella. Eh, les quiero decir que 
valoramos tanto el poder estar en una organización de esta magnitud por la importancia de los temas que se manejan y por el impacto que podemos hacer en el mundo real. Es muy importante y esto, ¿cómo se logra? Se logra tejiendo fino, con mucho trabajo, con mucho diálogo y mucha negociación, pero no podemos tardar mucho en concretar, porque el mundo sigue andando afuera y porque tenemos una crisis mundial muy importante. Me siento muy orgullosa del trabajo que en esta asamblea hizo el Grupo Latinoamericano en su reunión interna, porque logramos ponernos de acuerdo para sacar una resolución común, una declaración común sobre el crimen organizado en la región latinoamericana y eso es un ejemplo de que con diálogo, con esfuerzo, pudimos encontrar los puntos comunes y pudimos acercarnos y pudimos sacar una declaración conjunta que nos sirva a todos los países latinoamericanos. Así que con el ejemplo de Latinoamérica eh, me despido de ustedes pidiéndoles que podamos dialogar fuertemente, que sigamos haciendo esfuerzos mucho más fuertes, más concretos y a mayor velocidad, porque el multilateralismo se tiene que fortalecer para beneficio de todo el mundo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, President of Grulak. I'll now call the representative of the President of 12 Plus, uh, Ms. Rutan from France. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, chers collègues, je m'exprime au nom de notre Président Andrés Griffroy. Le groupe des 12 Plus s'est réuni le 22 mars pour une longue réunion dans l'après-midi et chaque matin du 26 et du, 20, du 24 au 26 mars. Les membres du groupe des 12 Plus ont été très actifs au sein des différentes commissions, notamment la Commission permanente du développement durable qui a examiné et approuvé le projet de résolution d'une collègue du groupe des 12 Plus, Madame Lesia Vasilenko, sur les partenariats pour l'action climatique, promouvoir l'accès à une énergie verte abordable et encourager l'innovation, la responsabilité et l'équité. Ce sujet ne disparaîtra pas de l'ordre du jour pendant les prochaines décennies et nous tenons à féliciter nos collègues, Madame Vasilienko, sa collègue Madame Mira Sultan des Émirats Arabes Unis et le collègue de l'Inde. Le président du groupe des 12 Plus se réjouit également que la Commission permanente de la paix et de la sécurité internationale ait adopté la résolution de Monsieur Lacroix de la Belgique sur l'impact social et humanitaire des systèmes d'armes autonomes et de l'intelligence artificielle. Il s'agit d'un sujet important et complexe pour différentes raisons. Les discussions en commission ont été difficiles. Le texte a obtenu une large majorité, mais il n'a pas fait l'unanimité, y compris au sein de notre groupe des 12 plus, où certains pays auraient souhaité limiter le champ de la résolution aux armes létales. Cependant, les membres ont continué à se parler et la démocratie a joué son rôle. Félicitations à notre, à notre collègue belge pour son travail. L'intelligence artificielle restera à l'ordre du jour également, puisque la Commission permanente de la démocratie et des droits de l'homme travaille sur un projet de résolution qui sera discuté à la 150e Assemblée sur l'impact de l'intelligence artificielle sur la démocratie, les droits de l'homme et l'état des droits, du droit. Madame Rampel Garner du Canada, membre elle aussi du groupe des 12 Plus, et sa collègue de Tanzanie seront les co-rapporteurs. Nous tenons aussi à exprimer notre satisfaction concernant la deuxième motion de la Commission permanente des affaires des Nations unies, présidée par notre collègue David McGuinty du Canada. Le thème de cette motion, à savoir la réforme du Conseil de sécurité de l'ONU, euh, pourrait difficilement être plus important à l'heure où le monde s'enflamme en de nombreux endroits. Dans ce contexte, nous déplorons le fait que cette Assemblée n'ait à nouveau pas réussi à trouver un consensus sur le conflit qui fait rage au Moyen-Orient. Lors de l'Assemblée de Luanda, le président des 12 Plus avait exprimé l'espoir que le sujet soit moins conflictuel lors de la prochaine Assemblée et il a indiqué qu'il était du devoir des parlementaires de continuer à tout mettre en œuvre pour inverser la situation actuelle. En dépit de vos efforts, Madame la Présidente, 
et de ceux de nombreuses autres délégations que nous tenons à remercier, nous avons collectivement échoué à atteindre un compromis. Nous voulons rester constructifs malgré tout et saluons les efforts et la volonté de nombreuses délégations pour parvenir à un accord. La résolution adoptée lundi au Conseil de sécurité nous montre que c'est possible, en même temps qu'elle suscite de profonds regrets. Cependant, l'attention massive portée à ce conflit ne doit pas détourner l'attention de l'Ukraine, où la guerre se poursuit sans relâche. Nous exhortons les parlementaires russes à jouer pleinement leur rôle au lieu de se faire les porte paroles de leur régime et d'être complices de nombreux crimes de guerre et de crimes contre l'humanité. Nous remercions tous les collègues pour les échanges inspirants que nous avons eus. Le secrétariat de l'UIP a de nouveau fourni un travail exemplaire et nous tenons à remercier une fois de plus un pilier du secrétariat qui prend une retraite bien méritée, je veux citer Saliane Sader, bien évidemment. Enfin, Madame la Présidente, nous vous remercions infiniment pour la manière dont vous avez vous avez présidé pour la première fois nos débats avec euh, sagesse, avec patience et avec euh, votre sens de la diplomatie dans des conditions qui, est lo qui étaient loin d'être évidentes. Bon retour à tous et nous vous attendons euh, évidemment avec impatience pour la prochaine Assemblée dans ces lieux. Je vous remercie. Thank you so much, Ms. Ruton. We will now hear from Eurasia, uh, the representative of the president of the Eurasia Group, Ms. Sovinar Vadanyang. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you, Chair. Madam President, colleagues, on be behalf of the Eurasia Geopolitical Group, I wish to thank all parliamentarians the IPU and the International Secretariat for the tremendous work done. Also, let us thank you personally, Madam President and the Secretary General for the statement on the situation in Gaza. Despite the fact that an emergency item was not passed, we can state that, that the 148th uh, Assembly was a success. The subject item of the general debate is very topical and enabled leg legislators to address parliamentary diplomacy, which nowadays plays a crucial role for many countries. I would like also to mention Secretary General's personal commitment and contribution to this topic. As a female parliamentarian, I wish to emphasize IPU's contribution to the issue of inclusiveness when no one is left behind. Dear colleagues, since the year since this year, the Global Conference of Young MPs will take place in Yerevan. I am pleased to say that we are waiting for you in our sunny Armenia in September. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, dear colleagues, we have come to an end of listening to our uh, geopolitical groups and the statements that they had to make. So we are very grateful for all the leadership of all the geopolitical groups. You are doing an amazing job and we look forward to keep working closely with you. Let me now take this uh, opportunity to welcome our Secretary General for some concluding remarks. He looks surprised because we have completed, I think, the session before time, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Secretary General, you have the floor. Can you hear? Yes, you can hear me. Mad Madam President, thank you for giving me this, uh, the floor. Uh, let me say that, yes, I'm really amazed because uh, we are finishing on time. This is your maiden assembly. And we see the presiding officer in you. You have chaired the debates of this uh, assembly in a very efficient manner. And so we can pride ourselves on uh, uh, being able to finish on time or way ahead of time. And since we are uh, finishing way ahead of time, Madam President, maybe I should take about a couple of hours to say thank you to, 
<laughs> I just want to uh, thank you all on behalf of my colleagues and myself for the very kind words that uh, you have expressed in various forms here during this past several days. Uh, we are just honored to be able to be of service to the global community of parliamentarians that you represent. And you can be sure that your words of encouragement uh, go down our hearts and we will continue to do our best. As we draw the curtain to this uh, 148th assembly, I cannot help going back to the 30th of June, 1889, when the founding fathers of this organization convened the inaugural conference of the IPU in Paris, a few uh, hours by train from here. At that gathering, there were 94 delegates, 94 men. There were no women in that, uh, in that meeting. All were men, MPs convened by Kremer and Passy. They came from a handful of countries, nine, nine countries, attended the inaugural conference of the IPU. Today, as we rise, we see that over the past one week or so, 1,500 persons, men and women, have converged on Geneva, including 700 members of parliament here, where the women account for 36% of the total participation here. And you'll agree with me, and you'll agree with me that our founding fathers, uh, Kramer and Passy, would be smiling all the way to the bank because of the fact that their dream has come true, that the global parliamentary community that has expanded uh, to this extent can come to the city of peace and hold a dialogue that is intended to promote dialogue, as many of you have said here, but also to bring about peace in the world, to bring about democracy, and ultimately uh, development. Uh, Madam President, members of uh, parliament present here, I don't go want to go into the details of the deliberations that you have had during these past several days. I believe the various reports bear testament to the wealth of uh, the outcomes of uh, this uh, very important global cadring. But let me uh, mention one thing that I believe has been a hallmark of this assembly. You will have seen that the IPU is increasingly digitally transformed. And as I say this, I remember a conversation I had with the Speaker of Parliament a couple of days ago, and he said, Mr. Secretary General, it looks like you are economizing all the resources of this organization. I said, how so, Mr. Speaker? He said, we don't have any bags, we don't have any conference bags here. And I was quick to point out to him that the IPU was walking the talk when it came to fighting climate change. I said, we had a long policy, a long-term policy of reducing the volume of paper that we produce in our different uh, meetings and operations. And that is why we did not find it necessary to provide bags because there, were, there was no paper to move around. Everything is on your cell phone today. Everything is on a tablet. You have uh, QR codes, barcodes all over the place so that you have access to those document documents that before you would have had to pick up at a desk here in large quantities that you would leave in the hotel. So it is our way of promoting that campaign that we launched the last year, Parliament for the Planet. We show that we want to walk the talk and we hope that our member parliaments will emulate this example. In a way, therefore, we have gone electronic, in fact, and we are heartened by the, by the fact that the members have now decided to grapple with the intricacies of artificial intelligence, trying to see how they can harness the positive potential for, from this technology and also mitigating the risks and dangers. I believe this is something that you as the global parliamentary leaders will be doing as a service 
uh, to humanity. So as we conclude this session, I just want to refer to something that is happening this year. Reference has been made to the fact that this organization was born in 1889, which means that this year we are 135 years old. Uh, somebody said that we might disappear because we become irrelevant. It's not true. The values that you defend, the values that were articulated by our governing, uh, or rather our founding fathers, are enduring. Dialogue for peace. And so we would like for you to use this 135th anniversary of the IPU to amplify the messages that our founding fathers did bequeath to us. We hope that this will be an opportunity for you to rededicate to peace efforts, to peace initiatives around the world, as this year is the focal year for peace for the IPU. We hope that you will use the opportunity to organize events in your countries uh, to celebrate this hallmark. And I believe I speak on behalf of my colleague, the Director of Communications, who is here, that we stand ready to provide every assistance that we can provide so that you can make that day a success. And please do let us know so that we can amplify what you are doing in support of your day. So, Madam President, let me, on behalf of my colleagues in the Secretariat, say goodbye to you all. It's only an au revoir, as they say in French, because I know you will be coming back here in October, and we're looking forward to, be, to serve you when you are here in October. Bon voyage, therefore. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary General, for those very kind remarks. I now invite myself to give you the <laughs> remarks. Mai Muye. Mr. Secretary General, Honorable Speakers, Deputy Speakers, Members of Parliament, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by expressing my deepest gratitude to all the colleagues who have played a very pivotal role in the seamless organization and the success of the 148th IPU Assembly. Your tireless work, passion, and dedication have not gone unnoticed. I would also like to extend a heartfelt thank you to the Swiss authorities for their warm welcome and for providing an ideal setting for our deliberations. Thank you. The IPU is headquartered in Geneva. As such, we have an embassy here. Or even better, a second home for all of us, 46,000 members of parliament in the world. Six years after the last Geneva Assembly, I have to say I'm very happy to be back here. And I cannot think of a better way to begin my term as president of IPU. 719 members of parliament from 141 different countries, including 51 speakers of parliament, have come here to deliberate on the theme, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. This has sent a very strong signal to the international community to our friends at the United Nations and international organizations, diplomats, international, international NGOs, and other multilateral stakeholders in this city and all over the world. As parliamentarians, we are contributing, supporting, and accompanying your efforts. We are eager to advance and reinvigorate multilateralism with a strong parliamentary dimension. And we must base our work on the principle of inclusive dialogue as the only way to achieve long lasting peace. My fellow parliamentarians, your, your active participation 
insightful contributions, and unwavering commitment to the IPU have been the foundation of the Assembly's success. Over the last week, we have heard many inspiring examples of how you employ parliamentary diplomacy to address the multiple challenges to peace and international security our world is facing today. But we have not only heard examples in speeches, we have also practiced parliamentary diplomacy with the goal of taking much needed steps forward, uh, steps towards peace. This assembly will go down in history as the first time that the speakers of Armenia and Azerbaijan sat down to discuss how their parliaments could support ongoing efforts to normalize relations between the two countries. Thank you. Thank you. The IPU task force on the peaceful resolution of the war in Ukraine continued to be one of the few remaining formats in which Ukrainians and Russians engage, and it is looking to make incremental progress on the issue of displaced children. We have adopted significant resolutions on the implications of autonomous weapon systems and artificial intelligence on affordable green energy and a motion on Security Council reform. And we have held substantive discussions on multilateralism, interfaith dialogue, human and common security, and minority rights, among many other issues. Dear friends, we have adopted a major political statement of the need to urgently address the situation in Gaza. We must now move from words to action. We have adopted our Geneva Declaration on Parliamentary Diplomacy, emphasizing our collective responsibility to foster dialogue, mutual respect, and pursuit of peaceful coexistence across political, ideological, religious, and geographical divide. This is not merely about conducting parliamentary diplomacy for the sake of it. It is about bringing the outcomes of our dialogue back to our home countries and making good use of our legislative oversight and budgetary powers to translate them into national realities for the well-being of our people. Dear friends, as I mentioned in my opening remarks to this assembly in 2024, the IPU will be celebrating its 135th anniversary. The world has changed dramatically since the 19th century, yet our mission remains ever so vital. I would like to reiterate my invitation to take our Geneva Declaration back to your parliament and organize a special event on parliamentary diplomacy, perhaps in advance of the International Day of Parliamentarism on June 30th, which coincides with the IPU's anniversary. In addition to commemorating the International Day of Parliamentarians, it is crucial for us to reflect upon effectiveness of the interparliamentary union and its impact on our respective nations. As we convene during the general debate, it is essential that parliamentarians not only share their views on the theme under discussion, but also provide an account of the progress made in implementing the IPU's resolutions. This practice will enable us to learn from our colleagues who have efficiently and effectively implemented relevant resolutions while also holding ourselves accountable to the commitments made at IPU meetings. By measuring our own implementation efforts against these benchmarks, we can ensure that resolutions are not mere rhetoric, but translate into concrete actions that benefit our societies. This introspection and measurement of implementation which will strengthen our collective endeavors to effectively implement IPU's resolutions. It will foster mutual support, collaboration, and the exchange of best practices 
among member parliaments. Recognizing the areas where support and capacity building are needed, we can seek the necessary resources to overcome challenges and fulfill our commitments. Through this progress and this process, we can ensure that the IPU remains a driving force for genuine and impactful change, where resolutions are transformed into actions that positively shape our democratic societies. This assembly has marked the beginning of my tenure as president of IPU. And I would like to say that the IPU is only as strong as its membership. And through your engagement, unity, and determination, we will be able to make a tangible difference in the lives of the people we serve. I look forward to seeing all of you at our next assembly in October this year. I will now beg your indulgence to go uh, on my seat so that we rise together for our IPU and anthem to mark the closing of uh, our 148th uh, assembly in Geneva. Thank you so much for listening to me. May we all rise for our IPU, um, IPU anthem, please. declare the 148th assembly of the IPU officially closed.
Good morning. 